Hi there, welcome back. My name is Sean, and uh, this video will talk about electroradiography. And just a disclaimer before I will start this video is made for educational purposes. That is, so if you have any cardiac problem or any health conditions, you have to see your primary care provider or you have to see your cardiologist because these doctors they know your history, they know your condition, so they can give most appropriate management or treatment. Okay, and since I don't have any whiteboard here with me wherein I can write. So might as well jot down or take important, take notes, some of the important things here for electrocardiography and you can replay as often as you want. Okay, so let's begin. When you say electrocardiography, electrocardiography refers to graphic illustration or presentation of electrical activities in the heart. So it refers to say it is a test that records electrical activities in the heart. It will not record contraction. It records electrical activities. That is why for you to better understand ECG, you need to understand, go back and understand your cardiovascular system, your anatomy and physiology. So that's what we're going to do now. Let's go back to your anatomy and physiology of your cardiovascular before we will talk about ECG, okay? So in your cardiovascular system, it is a system that circulates blood around the body. The primary structure in your cardiovascular is actually your heart. Our heart is situated in the mediastinum or mediastinum. It is made up of a hollow muscular structure and that muscle is your involuntary muscle tissue. So this structure pumps the blood out, okay? And this structure, the heart, the organ, okay, is divided into two sides. We have the right side and the left side of the heart. These two sides are separated by a membrane called septum, okay? This is what we call your septum. And inside the heart, it has four chambers in it. So you have the right atrium, the left atrium, the right ventricle, and the left ventricle. So basically, we have two atria and two ventricles, okay? Apart from these chambers, there are also structures in it. So you have your superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, or superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, as you say, okay? This is your pulmonary trunk. Okay, these are what they call the pulmonary arteries, the only arteries in the body that carry unoxygenated blood. Your pulmonary veins, another pulmonary veins here, okay, the only veins in the body that carry oxygenated blood, okay, I said left atrium, left ventricle. So this is your pulmonary tract, I said that, this is what we call the arc of aorta or your aorta, okay, so identify common structures in the heart. Aside from those structures in the heart, there is a connective tissue, a connective structure, a connective tissue named valve, okay? Now remember, there are two common valves in the heart. First is the AV valve. AV stands for atrioventricular valve. And another type of valve in the heart is what they call your semilunar valve, okay? So AV valve and semilunar valve. I will discuss AV valve first. An AV valve is a valve in between the atrium and ventricle. So any valve caught between atrium and ventricle is called AV valve. Atrium ventricle in between is AV valve. So we have two AV valves. An AV valve on the right side is what we call tricuspid valve. Okay, we call it tricuspid because it has three flaps or three cusps. On the left side, the AV valve there is what we call mitral or bicuspid valve. We call it mitral or bicuspid because it has two flops or two casps, okay? So diameter AV valve. Last type of valve in the heart is your semilunar valve. We call it semilunar. These are valves attached to your great vessels. So what are these big vessels or great vessels in the heart? You have the pulmonary trunk and your aorta. So a semilunar valve attached to your pulmonary trunk is what we call pulmonary semilunar valve. Okay, a semilunar valve attached to your aorta is what we call your aortic semilunar valve. Remember that valves may differ on its name, location, number of casts. Regardless of these differences, okay, these valves serve one purpose, and that is to prevent reflux or regurgitation. Having said that, prevents reflux or regurgitation, it follows that if you have valvular defect or valvular abnormality, the likelihood to have reflux or regurgitation increases. And what else? When valves close, take note, when valves close, they create sound. Can you call that your heart sound, your lub dub, or your S1 and S2? Lob, that is your S1, dub, that is your S2. Lob or S1 is due to the closure of your AV valves. 
dub or S2 is due to closure of Prosema lunar valves. In short, when these valves close, they produce sound, lob, lob, lob. When these two valves close, they produce sound, dub, dub, lob, dub. That is why lob, dub or heart sound is due to valvular closure. It follows then, apart from your okay, apart from your reflux or regurgitation, just in case you have valvular defect, you may also manifest abnormal heart sounds due to valvular defect. Okay, valvular defect is very common to patient with GABS infection. That's your group A beta hemolytic streptococcal infection because this microorganism has a greater affinity to connective tissues. Okay, which happens to patient with rheumatic heart disease or to patient with frequent sore throat. Okay, so you watch out in that now. I said that we have two sides, right side and the left side. I mentioned that the right side of the heart receives blood from the systemic and basically that is sure unoxygenated blood or deoxygenated blood. When that blood enters the right side of the heart, it is responsibility now of the right side of the heart to pump the blood, okay, pump it to your pulmonary area for oxygenation purposes. Okay, now once the blood is oxygenated, okay, once the blood is oxygenated, that blood goes to your pulmonary veins and the pulmonary veins now will direct the blood on the left side of the heart. That is why left side of the heart receives and pumps oxygenated blood. And by the way, if you want to check, okay, how good or okay, the right side of the heart functioning, Okay, the test that can be performed there is your CVP, your central venous pressure. Okay, it is a pressure that monitors the right side of the heart and the thing there, okay, threaded, is placed on the right side of the heart, particularly on the right atrium. So don't forget that an increase in the CVP would mean hypervolemia. A decrease in the CVP would mean hypovolemia. What about on the left side of the heart? If you want to check left side of the heart functioning, a test that can be performed there is your PCWP or your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. It is a procedure where the doctor threads a catheter, your Swan's gas catheter, okay, directly into your pulmonary, okay, pulmonary trunk. So an increase in the PCWP would mean congestion and a decrease in your PCWP would mean shock. Okay? Now, the primary function of the heart is actually to pump the blood out. That's it. Okay? So it pumps the blood out so that the, okay, all vital organs in the body will receive enough blood supply. Okay? So that's the, that's the main function of the heart. Okay, look. With the pumping mechanism of the heart, with the pumping mechanism of the heart, it makes sure that all systems in the body, all structures in the body will receive enough blood supply. So can you imagine if you have cardiac arrest or there's a cessation of heartbeat or in, where in heart fails to pump, blood flow to the brain is affected, blood flow to your kidneys are also, okay, are, okay, is also affected. That is why you have to take good care of your heart because if that heart fails to pump, it's a big, big problem, okay? By the way, inability of the heart to pump well is what we call heart failure, okay? So that's it. In order for the heart to pump, to contract, there are a series of electrical activities happening inside. This is the concept you need to understand to appreciate electrocardiography, the conduction system in the heart. Okay? Let's identify the structure first. Superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, right atrium, okay, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. So this is the flow of her impulse transmission or conduction system. This is what we call the SA node. SA stands for sinoatrial node. SA node is said to be the pacemaker of the heart. What do you mean by that? Pacemaker, it means to say it will set the pacing. It will set the rhythm. Okay? So this is what we call the SA node pacemaker. Once SA node is okay, once SA node is healthy, okay, you will have a good rhythm. Okay, by the way, SA node can generate a heart rate ranging from 60 to 100 beats per minute. If the heart rate is greater than 100, we call that as your tachycardia. If the heart rate is less than 60, we call that as your bradycardia. This, another here node, is what we call the AV node. Okay, AV node can generate a heart rate ranging from 40 to 60 beats per minute. Okay, don't forget this. As a node can generate a heart rate ranging from 60 to 100, your AV node can generate a heart rate ranging from 40 to 60, okay? 
So as a node, a b node, bundle of his, this bundle of his will bifurcate into right branch and left branch down to your Perkin G fibers, okay? So just to recap, the flow of your conduction system, the flow of your okay, conduction pathway inside the heart will be from the SA node to AB node, bundle of his, right branch, left branch, down to your Perkin G fibers. It follows that the conduction pathway inside the heart will start from the base to the apex. So don't forget that. The flow of your conduction will be from the base to the apex. Remember, this is the apex of the heart. This is the base. That is the flow of your conduction. Now, what if the SA node has a problem? Who will take over your SA node? You have your AB node. Okay? Once the AB node has malfunctioning or has some issues in it, who will take over? The ventricular area, ectopic foci. That is why it is not your ectopic foci in the ventricular area. It can only generate a heart rate ranging from 20 to 40 beats per minute. And we don't survive, we don't live at 20 beats per minute. That is why it follows that if you have SA node, AV node malfunctioning, okay, pacemaker implicate implantation is essential. That is why pacemaker implant is needed okay, to patient with SA, AV node malfunctioning. Okay, so that's it. Now, with your conduction system in your myocardial contractility, this is the scenario. Once SA node is stimulated, okay, once SA node is stimulated, that can cause contraction of the right and left atrium. As the atrium contract, the impulse will travel going down, okay? And that impulse will follow this pathway from SA node to AV node, bundle of his, right and left branches, and the impulse is distributed here to your Perkin G fibers in your apex, in your ventricular area. That is why when the impulse travel going down, there's no more impulse on top. As a result, the atrium will relax because there's no more impulse there. The impulse is here in the ventricular area. That is why if the impulse is there in the ventricular area, in the apex of the heart, it's now time for the ventricles to contract. After the ventricles contract, they will relax. So it goes like this, right and left atrium, right and left ventricle. Once as a node is stimulated, it can cause contraction of the right and left atrium. As the atrium contracts, the impulse will travel going down from the base to the apex. The pathway will be as a node to AV node, bundle of his, right and left branches down to your Perkin G fibers. When the impulse travel going down, there's no more impulse on top. As a result, the atria will relax. The ventricles will contract. Why ventricles contract? Because the impulse is there, right? So after ventricles contract, the ventricles now will relax. Don't forget that concept, okay? So you're done with that concept conduction system. Now, I think you're now ready to understand electrocardiography. So just to recap, electrocardiography is a test that records electrical activities in the heart. It will not record contraction. But common sense will tell us that if there are electrical activities going on inside the heart, those electrical activities can eventually cause myocardial contraction. Okay? And these electrical activities will be, are actually represented as waves. So we have this what we call your PQRS T wave or the P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave. We will discuss that in a while. Now, most of you working in the hospital, okay, most probably you heard some uh, practitioners will tell you EKG or ECG. So which is which? ECG or EKG, they're both correct. They're both correct, okay? But I suggest you say EKG, not ECG. Why? Because if you say ECG frequently, you will hear that as EEG or electroencephalogram. That is a test that records electrical activities in the brain. Remember, we may come from different nationalities, different countries, and we have different accent. So that is why to prevent the error hearing ECG as EEG, you say that as EKG to prevent that mistake. So what will happen is if you misheard that as EEG, wrong diagnostic test will be performed to your patient, okay? So again, it is a test that records electro electrical activities in the heart. And these electrical activities are represented as waves. So you have the P wave, 
the keywords complex and the T wave. P wave represents atrial depolarization, the QRS complex represents atrial repolarization and ventricular depolarization, and the T wave represents ventricular repolarization. Sorry. So there are two, sorry. Hold on. So there are two words you need to remember depolarization and red polarization. So if we're going to understand depolarization, the depolarization means there's influx of positive ions inside the cell. So as a result, when there's influx of positive ions in the cell, they lose its negativity, okay? So when you say depolarization, it turns the cell positively charged. As a result, the cells now, the muscles will contract. Okay, so when you say atrial depolarization, there is stimulation of the atria, and eventually the atria will contract. So when you say P wave, P wave represents stimulation of the atria, or the cells in the atria turns positive, and eventually it will contract. That's your P wave. QRS complex represents atrial repo. So what is repolarization? Repolarization means okay, the cell goes back to its normal state. Okay, normal state, there's resting phase or relaxation. Remember, after a cell depolarizes, it needs to repolarize, repolarized. Okay, and since the, okay, the impulse travel going down, it is now time for the ventricles to depolarize. Am I right? So as the ventricles now, the cells in the ventricles turn to be positively charged. There's influx of positive ions and they lose its negativity. The ventricle membrane now or the ventricle muscles in the ventricle will contract. That is key recorded as your QRS complex. So the QRS complex basically represents resting of the atria, stimulation of the ventricles, and once stimulated, ventricles will contract. And after ventricles will contract, they will relax into its normal state. That is your T wave, ventricular red polarization. So to make it easy, when you say dead polarization, stimulate it, just to make it easy, okay? Red polarization, red resting. So remember, before a muscle can be depolarized, it must be on its repolarized state, okay? So again, P wave, atrial stimulation, QRS, atrial resting, ventricular stimulation, and then your T wave is your ventricular risk K resting. Let's correlate that with your conduction system. Let's review. Right and left atrium, right and left ventricle. What did it tell you? Once as a node is stimulated, that can cause contraction of the right and left atrium. As the atria contracts, the impulse will travel going down from the base to the apex. As the impulse travels down to the ventricular area, normal impulse on top. Impulse is here. As a result, atria will relax, ventricles will contract. After ventricles contract, they will relax. Let's correlate that with your EKG. Again, right and left atrium, right and left ventricle. What did I tell you again? Once SA node is stimulated, that can cause contraction of the right and left atrium. P wave, atrial depolarization, atrial stimulation. The impulse to travel going down. As the impulse travel going down, normal impulse on top, impulse is here. Therefore, atrial will relax, ventricles will contract. QRS complex, atrial resting, ventricular stimulation. And after ventricles contract, the ventricles will relax. T wave, ventricular red polarization. So this will be your electrocardiography with your conduction system. P wave, QRS complex, T wave. P wave, atrial depot, QRS complex, atrial repo, ventricular depot, and T wave, ventricular rep polarization. P wave, QRS complex, T wave. P wave, QRS complex, T wave. That is why if you're going to ask me what specific chamber okay, represents activity of the atria, what specific, not chamber, what specific wave will represent activity of the atria? Answer, P wave. What specific wave will represent the activity of the ventricles? Answer, QRS complex. So don't forget this. P wave will represent the activity of the atria. QRS complex will represent the activity of the ventricular, ventricular chambers. 
That is why if you're going to read the ECG and if you want to know if there's an existing atrial problem, look for the P wave. If you want to know if there is an existing problem in the ventricles of the patient, look for the QRS complex because P wave represents atrial activity. QRS complex represents ventricular activity. Okay, make sense? I hope so. Now, if you're going to look at the ECG strip, the recording will, be, will look like this. So this is your P, Q, R, S, complex, T wave. P wave, Q, R, S, complex, T wave. So the movement will be like this. Right and left atrium, right and left ventricle. P wave, Q, R, S, complex, T wave. P wave, Q, R, S, complex, T wave. Therefore, common sense will tell us that P, Q, R, S, T is one heartbeat. Make sense? P, Q, R, S, T is one heartbeat. Now, P wave, as mentioned, atrial depot. Q, R, S, atrial repo, ventricular depot. T wave, ventricular red polarization. Simple as that. The normal heart rate ranges from 60 to 100. I said a heart rate of more than 100 is what we call tachycardia. A heart rate of less than 60, we call that as your bradycardia. Your ECG tracing is recorded in your ECG strip. And in the ECG strip, you can see small boxes and big boxes, okay? Just a reminder, this is a small box, and this is one big box. It will be easy for you to identify because the borders of the big box are always darkened, okay? Now look, one small box, one small box is equivalent to 0 0.04 second. I said 0 0.04, I did not say 0 0.4, okay? 0 0.04 second. If one small box is 0 0.04 second, what about one big box? Remember, one big box has five small boxes. One, two, three, four, five. It has five small boxes in one big box. So how many seconds is your one big box? All you have to do is to multiply. 0 0.04 times five. What is the product? 0.20 second. Therefore, one small box is 0 0.04. One big box is 0.20, okay? What about if we have two small boxes? Two small boxes would mean 0 0.08, am I right? Why 0 0.08? Because 0 0.04 multiplied that by 2, that will give you 0 0.08. If you have 3 small boxes, that will be 0.12. Am I right? If you have 5 small boxes, that will be 0.20 second. Please don't forget that. That is so essential in your ECG reading. Another thing. One small box, the height of one small box is equivalent to 1 millimeter, 1 mm. Since there are 5 small boxes, in one big box, how many millimeters will be one big box? Answer, five millimeters or five mm. Don't forget that, okay? So there are values you need to remember. Normal heart rate, I said 60 to 100. Normal PR interval is 0.12 to 0.20 second. So if it's 0.12 to 0.20 second, how many small boxes are these? Answer, it's three to five small boxes. That's your PR interval. Where is your PR interval? This is your PR interval. The beginning of your P wave and this part, okay? Before it touches your QRS complex. So this is your PR interval. How many small boxes are these? One, two, three. Three small boxes. One small box is 0 0.04. Multiply that by three, it's 0.12. The normal is 0.12 to 0.20 or 3 to 5 small boxes. That's your PR interval. Okay? Next is your QRS complex. The normal QRS complex is 0.08 to 0.12. In short, 0.08 to 0.12, how many small boxes are those? It's 2 to 3 small boxes. So it's your QRS complex. This is your QRS, your QRS complex. How many small boxes are these? It's one, two, two small boxes. Two small boxes equivalent to 0 0.08. That's normal, 
Okay? So again, normal heart rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute. Normal PR interval is, okay, about 3 to 5 small boxes. The normal QRS complex is 2 to 3 small boxes. Please don't forget that. Okay? Next. Your ECG strip will look like this. Okay? Now look. This is your big box. Again, the borders are darkened. Inside the big box are small boxes. Am I right? Again, one small box, 0 0.04. One big box, 0.20. One small box, one millimeter. One big box, five millimeters. On the upper part of your ECG strip, there is a grid, a line. See this line? From this line to another line is equivalent to three seconds, okay? So if this is three seconds and another three seconds, this will be your six-second strip, okay? Your six-second strip is so important when you read or identify the heart rate of your patient, okay? So from this line to this line, three seconds. If you add another line, another batch, that will make it a six-second strip, okay? Please don't forget that. Now, let's go back to your K, to your waves. P, Q, R, S, T. P wave, atrial depot, Q, R, S complex, atrial repo, ventricular depot. T wave, ventricular rep polarization. Heart rate normal is 60 to 100. PR interval is 3 to 5 small boxes. Q, R, Q, R, S complex is 2 to 3 small boxes. Those are values you need to remember, okay? Now, look. P wave is deflected upward. T wave is deflected upward. There are several phases of your T wave you need to remember in your ECG tracing. I hope you remember, okay? I hope you heard inverted T wave or T wave inversion. Remember that the T wave is always upward. The moment that the T wave is downward, we call that as inverted T wave. Am I right? Inverted T wave. If the T wave is upward, that's normal. If it's downward, it's inverted. Can you follow? Next. This is your S. This is your T. This line here is what we call ST segment. An ST segment follows an isoelectric line. The imaginary line here, we call that as your isoelectric line. If that ST segment is above isoelectric line, we call that as elevated ST segment. If the ST segment is below the isoelectric line, we call that as a depressed ST segment. Elevated ST segment is common to patients with acute myocardial infarction, just like your STEMI, your ST elevated myocardial infarction. Okay, a depressed ST segment can also be seen to patient with electrolyte imbalances. Okay, especially if that electrolyte concern okay affected is your potassium. Okay, now I also mentioned a while ago your T wave, right? I said there is such thing as inverted T wave. Normally, a T wave, as I said, is deflected upward. If the T wave is like this, it's inverted T wave. That would represent as ischemia, myocardial ischemia. Myocardial ischemia is the reason why you have angina pectoris, right? So what is myocardial ischemia? Myocardial ischemia is a condition wherein there's inability of the coronary arteries to supply blood adequately, okay? So that is what we call ischemia, inverted T wave, okay? Next. So another thing is your T wave here. T wave looks like this normally. If your T waves looks like R wave, tall, peak T wave, that could be an indication of hyperkalemia. So again, your T wave looks like this. But if your T waves looks like an R wave, that becomes your tall peak T wave, you suspect hyperkalemia or an elevated potassium in the blood. So a tall peak T wave looks like this. Okay, if you happen to say this in the ECG tracing of your patient, okay, you check the lab result, check for the BMP, look at your potassium if it is elevated, okay? So again, isoelectric line here, the ST segment is elevated, okay? These are different phases of your ST segment elevation. 
Okay, Q wave is like this one. Okay, Q wave. Normally, we cannot see Q wave in the ECG. But if Q wave is prominent, okay, a prominent Q wave, that could be an indication of what we call transmural infarction. It means to say that it affects all layers of the heart. There's MI, pathological Q wave. Okay, so again, T wave inverted or T wave inversion okay, would mean ischemia. Okay. U wave. Okay, look. This is your P. Your Q must be here. R, S, T. And there's another U wave. Okay. U wave represents hypokalemia or a decrease in the blood potassium level. Prominent U wave is a classic tracing of a patient with hypokalemia. So again, pulpic T wave is hyperkalemia. Prominent U wave is for hypokalemia, a decrease in your potassium. Okay, we need to understand now the 12 lead EKG or the 12 lead ECG. Now, what is the importance of your 12 lead EKG? Now, for example, let's say that this is our heart, okay? So, if you're looking at the heart right now, or this is the mouse, part of the mouse that you can see is this side, right? You cannot see this side, you cannot see this side, and you cannot see the back part of the mouse, am I right? Your 12 lead ECG are the 12 views of the heart. In short, with your 12 lead EKG, you can see the different views, different angles of the heart. That is why your 12 lead ECG is done for diagnosing patient, diagnostic quality. This is different from your cardiac monitor in the hospital. Your cardiac monitor is done for monitoring purposes, not for diagnosing patient. Okay, because if you're going to look at the difference in your cardiac monitor, you can clearly evaluate or see those waves. There are waves that can be seen clearly in your cardiac monitor. That is why if you want to diagnose patient, okay, you need to use the 12 lead EKG. And by the way, when you talk about 12 lead ECG, the, FK, the accuracy of your K12 lead ECG is only 60%. Okay, it is not 100% accurate. That is why okay, it is best to get ECG if the patient is symptomatic, okay? If the patient manifests something, that's the best time to obtain ECG because it changes from time to time, okay? Another thing to remember, if a patient is thin, okay? If the patient is thin and the chest wall is thin, and if you put the electrodes there for ECG monitoring or ECG tracing recording, okay, because of a thin okay, chest wall, Okay, what will happen there is that when you hook the patient to the electrode for monitoring, it records a very strong and a high at tall waves. That would be indicative of what we call enlargement of the heart. But in reality, there is no enlargement of the heart. It's just that the chest wall of the patient is thin. That is why body build will also affect ECG tracing. That is why if you have any abnormalities in the ECG of your patient, you correlate that with other tests. Do not just rely with your EK ECG. You have also to check if the patient manifests something. Okay? Let's proceed. And by the way, is ECG a form of dependent or an independent nursing action? Long time ago, ECG is a form of dependent responsibility. But now, we can obtain ECG if in your nursing judgment, there is a need for 12 lead EKG. So ECG now is a form of an independent responsibility. Okay? So again, I said a 12 lead ECG okay, gives different views or okay, different angles of the heart. It gives you an overall picture of the heart. Now, what are these 12 lead ECG? The 12 lead ECG is divided into two. Okay, the electrodes are leads placed on the chest. We call that a sure precordial leads, or we call that sure vector leads. That's what we call it V for vector. So V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. These are leads placed on the chest. These are what we call precordial lead or vector leads. Six. Another six are your limb leads, okay? So you have your lead one, lead two, lead three, AVR, AVL, AVF. So these six limb leads plus six chest leads will complete the 12 lead EKG. 
By the way, what does ABR, ABL, ABF stand for? ABR stands for Augmented Voltage Right. So it is placed on the right arm. AVL stands for Augmented Voltage Left. It is placed on the left arm. AVF stands for Augmented Voltage Foot. It is placed on the left foot. Okay? So your AVR, AVL, and AVF is on the left foot. But we know there's another thing placed on the right foot. And what is that? That is your ground. You need to have a ground attached on your right foot. Because without the ground, you cannot get any tracing. Okay? So remember, the placement of your precordial leads or vector leads universal. Wherever you go, there is no deviation. Okay? I will talk okay, about vector leads placement in a while. Now, I just want to emphasize your limb leads. Okay? You may have a different placement for your okay, limb leads. Some would place the limb lead the AVR here. Some would place it here. Some would place it here. Can we really place the AVR on this side or only on the distal part? Actually, either it's correct. The most important to remember here is that make it sure that when you place the AVR on the arms of the patient, on the right arm of the patient, or any augmented voltage leads, it will not touch the torso of your patient. Because the moment it touches the torso, okay, the result will not be reliable. Remember, as much as possible, we need to isolate those electrical activity to have more accurate tracing or recording. Okay? So, again, AVR, AVL, AVF is on the left foot, and on the right foot is your ground. What about for the placement of your vector leads? So the vector leads or precordial leads are your V1 to V6. V1 or vector 1 or precordial lead 1 is placed on the fourth intercostal space on the right sternal border. V2 is placed in front of your V1. And where's that? Fourth intercostal space on the left sternal border. Once you're done placing V1 and V2, you skip V3. Proceed, okay, proceed to V4. V4 is placed on the fifth intercostal space on the left mid clavicular line. So fifth intercostal space, left mid clavicular. This is to left clavicle. Left mid clavicular between middle of the left clavicle. So you place your V4 here. So V1, V2, V4. Once you're done placing your V4, that's the time you place your V3 or vector lead 3. You place your V3 between V2 and your V4. So V2, V4, in between, you place your V3. That is why I said you skip V3, you proceed to V4 first. Okay? So once you're done placing your V4, you're ready now to place your V3. You're ready to place your V5 and V6. Your V5 is placed perpendicular to your V4 on the anterior axillary line. Here, anterior axillary. Your V6 is placed perpendicular to your V5 on the mid axillary line. So again, look. So if this is my V1, V2, V4. V2, V4. Between V3. You place V3 here. Once I have my V4, now I can place V3, V5, and V6. V5 is placed perpendicular to your V4 on the anterior, anterior axillary line. This is your V5. V6 is placed perpendicular to your V5 on the mid axillary. It's anterior axillary, mid axillary line. Okay? So this is where you place your V6. So again, V1, V2, V4, V3, V5, V6. This will be the placement of your precordial lead or your chest leads. For your limb leads, you have your AVR, AVL, AVF is placed on the left foot, and on the right foot is your ground. Correct placement is essential to have more accurate tracing. Okay? So, I said that the 12-lead EKG will be the different views of the heart. Am I right? So, this will be your lead 1, lead 2, lead 3. Okay? So, this is your AVR on the right arm, AVL on the left arm, AVF on the left foot or left leg. Okay? And on the right foot or right leg will be your ground. Okay? 
So overall, it looks like this. So you have your K chest leads and you have your limb leads. It gives the 12K angles of the heart. So I said 12 views or 12 angles of the heart. What is the importance? Now let's go back. A 12 bit ECG for diagnostic quality will give an overall picture of the heart. High lateral area of the heart is reflected in your lead one and in your ABL. Inferior part of the heart, did I say lung a while ago? I'm referring about heart. Inferior part of the heart is reflected in your ECG or EKG in your lead two, lead three, and ABF. Make sense? Septal part of the heart is in your V1 and V2. Anterior part of the heart, it is in your V2, V3, and V4. Lateral part of the heart is in your V5 and V6. That is why you will know where is the site of injury. You will know where is the site of infarction. If you will have inverted T wave, which is ischemia, in your in your lead two, lead three, ABF, you know that ischemia happens in the inferior part of the heart. Can you follow? And you have to correlate what specific coronary artery supplies the inferior part of the heart. And I will have a separate discussion of that, the coronary blood supply of the heart, okay? And question, we have the 12 leads here, right? Okay, one, two, three, ABR, ABL, ABF, okay, B1, B2, B3, B4, B5, B6. And if you notice in the lowest part, lower part, bottom area is a long lead too. Remember, among the leads that we have here, the most stable lead is your lead two. That is why sometimes in the hospital, okay, you will encounter doctor's order, start 12 lead ECG or start 12 lead EKG with long lead two. Why long lead two? Because that is the most stable lead. That is why if you want to read the heart rate of your patient, if you want to know if there's dysrhythmia or abnormal rhythm, you have to use lead two because among the leads, it's the most stable. Make sense? I hope so. Let's proceed. Okay. So what are common ECG tracings you need to remember, okay, as a medical practitioner, or shall I say, for me, a fellow nurses, our fellow respiratory therapist. So there are different tracings you need to remember, okay? So we have your normal sinus rhythm, you have your sinus tachycardia, sinus bradycardia, atrial dysrhythmia, like atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation. We also have ventricular problem, ventricular dysrhythmia, like your VTAC, VFib. We also have your PVC. We also have your AV blocks, like your first degree AV block, second degree AV block Mobitz 1, second degree AV block Mobitz 2, third degree AV block, and we also have your SSTLA. So I will discuss all those tracings and some of incorporate meds and management as we go along the way, okay? So as of the moment, I want you to pause, review the different K waves, familiarize the placement of your PKRST, and we will go back and proceed to the next slide for different dysrhythmias or rhythmias, okay? Or arrhythmias, okay? Have a pause for a while. Hi there, welcome back. So I think you're done for a long break or whatever you did a while ago. So I believe when you play this one, you proceeded for this clip, you're now ready to understand the different dysrhythmias or arrhythmias Okay, with respect to your electrocardiogram. Okay, just a recap. So this is your P wave. Okay, QRS complex T wave. Remember that in every QRS complex, there is always one P wave. And every after QRS complex, there is T wave. And again, P, Q, R, S, T is one heartbeat. Remember, P wave atrial depolarization, QRS complex, atrial repo, ventricular depo, T wave, ventricular rep, polarization. Again, one P wave in every QRS. And P wave can be seen before QRS complex. And one T wave in every QRS. And T wave can be seen after QRS complex. And after T wave, is another key new heartbeat preceded by your P wave. 
Normal heart rate is 60 to 100. More than 100 is tachycardia. Less than 60 is bradycardia. The normal PR interval is three to five small boxes. Normal QRS is two to three small boxes. Those are things you need to remember. Now, for this, okay, for this clip, we will talk about common ryth okay, rhythms, okay, tracings in your ECG. So the outline will be, we will talk about normal sinus rhythm, then we'll talk about sinus tachycardia, sinus bradycardia, We'll talk about uh, atrial dysrhythmias, just like your atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation. Then we will also talk about ventricular dysrhythmias, just like your VTAC, VFib. We will also talk about PVCs. We will talk about acetole or acetole. Then we also we will talk about AV blocks, just like your first degree AV block, second degree AV block, Mobitz 1, second degree AV block, Mobitz 2. Then we will also talk about third degree, okay, third degree AV block. Okay, so the question here is that the moment you will see ECG, what is the first thing to do? Am I right? So for example, I'll give you an ECG strip now. What will you do first? The first thing to do there actually is to look for the lead 2. Why lead 2? Because lead 2, I said, is the most stable. So the moment you will have your lead 2, what will you do? Check the completeness of the waves. Do we have P wave? Do you have QRS complex? Do we have T wave? Can you follow? How many P waves do we have before QRS? How many T waves do we have after QRS? Are those waves com are the waves complete? That is the first thing to do. Okay. After that, you identify the heart rate. Okay. Check the heart rate of your patient. Remember, I said more than a hundred. That's tachycardia. Less than sixty. That's your bradycardia. Okay. Then after that, you check the PR interval. Remember, the normal PR interval is three to five small boxes okay then after that you can check if the tracing has rhythm or no rhythm at all okay so these are the things you need to do the moment you will have easy to strip on your hand by the way let me check my phone if it's recording or not hopefully yes it's recording good job okay so let's start now let's say you will have this strip in front of you What happened there? Let's say you will have this skate strip in front of you. Okay? The first thing to do, I said, is to check the completeness of your waves. Okay? So let's identify the waves here. So you have the P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave. P, Q, R, S, T. Just don't mind this, okay? P, Q, R, S, T. T, P, Q, R, S, T. We have one P wave in every Q, R, S. That's normal. We have one T wave after Q, R, S. That's normal. So all waves are complete. The second thing to do is to check the heart rate. How will you know the heart, how will you know the heart rate by merely looking at the ECG? There are several ways, okay, how to identify the heart rate. But I will teach you two common ways how to read the heart rate of your patient using an ECG. The first way is using a six second strip. Remember, from this line to this line is three seconds. Another batch here is another three seconds. So this will give us a six second strip. So how will you know the heart rate using a six second strip? All you have to do is to count how many R waves inside the six second strip. So it's your six second strip here is the line. So this R wave is not included. It's not part of the six second strip. So only in between the six second strip. So that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Am I right? Am I right? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight R waves inside the six second strip. So you identify that there are eight R waves inside the six second strip. So once you identify that, what will you do? Multiply that by 10. Is 10 a constant number? Yes, it is. Why multiply that by 10? Because if this is six second strip, you multiply that by 10, that becomes 60 seconds. 60 seconds, that's one minute. So if you have eight R waves inside the six second strip, multiply that by 10, 
8 times 10, the product is 80. That is the heart rate of your patient. 80 beats per minute. Is it normal? Yes, it is. Because the normal rate will be from 60 to 100. That's the first way. The second way to identify the heart rate, just in case you don't have a six second strip in front of you, is to memorize six numbers. So what are the six numbers you need to memorize to identify the heart rate of your patient? So the six numbers are the following. 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50. Again, 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50. So you identify now, you are able to identify, memorize the six numbers. 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50. How would you use the six numbers to identify the heart rate? Okay, rule number one. To identify the heart rate using the six magic numbers I gave you, look for an R wave that falls directly on a dark line. So this is your R wave number one, R wave number two, R wave number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven, number eight, number nine. Okay? Look for an R wave that falls directly in a dark line. This is an R wave that falls directly in a dark line. Remember I told you? The borders of the big box are darkened. I said these dark borders, big box, are so important if you identify the heart rate. This is it. Now we, we will apply that key specific principle. Look for an R wave that falls directly on a dark line. R wave. Then the next dark line, you start counting 300. Look. R wave that falls directly on a dark line. Start counting. 300, 150, 100, 75. Again. R wave that falls directly on a dark line. The next dark line, you start counting. 300, 150, 100, 75. The next R wave is between 75 and 100. That is the heart rate of the patient. 75 to 100 beats per minute. It's caught in between. Am I right? Is it normal? Yes, it is because the normal is 60 to 100. But if the R wave falls directly here on this dark line, then the heart rate is exactly 75 beats per minute. It just so happened that this R wave is caught in between these two dark lines. That is why we have range 75 to 100. Just don't forget the six numbers, 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50, okay? So these are two ways how to identify the heart rate of the patient. The first way is using the six second strip. I said, if you're going to use the six second strip, you count how many R waves inside the six second strip, multiply that by 10, that is the heart rate of your patient. The second way is to use the six magic numbers, 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50. So the rule here is look for an R wave that falls directly on a dark line and the next dark line you start counting 300 until such time you will reach the succeeding R wave. Okay, so that's how are you going to read the heart rate of your patient. Okay, hope you're able to understand and learn how to read heart rate using your ECG. Let's proceed to the next slide. So you'll be able to identify the heart rate of your patient. Okay, now look. So this is an ACG strip. Just an example. What will you do first? Again, look for the completeness of waves. P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S. P, Q, R, S, T. Now, what did I tell you? The first thing to do if you have ECG is to check the completeness of the waves. Are waves complete? Answer, yes. How many P wave before Q, R, S? Only one P wave. How many T wave after QRS? Only one T wave. Good. Next, check the heart rate. Remember, it's not a six second strip. So what will you do? We use the six magic numbers. Look for an R wave that falls directly on a dark line. The next dark line is start counting 300. Familiar? I hope so. So R wave that falls directly on a dark line. The next dark line will start counting. 300, 150, 100, 75, 60. Again, 300, 150, 100, 75, 60. 
The next hard wave is caught in between 60 and 75. That is the heart rate of your patient. 60 to 75 beats per minute. Is it normal? Yes, it's normal because the normal heart rate ranges from 60 to 100. So we know that there's a normal heart rate. Next, check for the PR interval. Remember, the PR interval is three to five small boxes. So where is your PR interval? Where is your PR interval? So this is your P, Q, R, S, T. So this is our PR interval. So how many boxes? One, two, three, four, five. At least 4.5 small boxes, right? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Is the PR interval normal? Yes, it is because I said the normal PR interval is three to five small boxes. So again, waves are complete. Heart rate is 60 to 75 beats per minute, which is normal. And PR interval is normal. So what is this? Are we done? No, not yet. Last is to check whether this tracing has rhythm or no rhythm at all. Ideally, when we check for rhythm, we use caliper. Since I don't have caliper with me, so let me use this bond paper, okay? So what I'm going to do here, we are going to measure the distance of our wave to the next R wave. Make it sure they have the same interval or spacing or distance. So I'm going to use our red marker and we will try to measure the distance of our wave to another R wave, okay? So look, do we have the same interval or spacing? If yes, then it means to say we have rhythm. So if we have rhythm, we know for the fact that the pacemaker is as a node, sinoatrial. So this is sinus rhythm, normal sinus rhythm. Why normal sinus rhythm? Normal because the heart rate is within the range. Sinus rhythm because the waves are complete and from the SA node, okay, normal interval of your R to R wave spacing, okay? So this is a normal sinus rhythm. So again, how will you know if it's normal sinus rhythm? Waves are complete with rhythm, heart rate with its normal range, and a normal PR interval. Now what about this one? This is your sinus tachycardia. Hold on. I'm looking for the, co the covering of my hand. Okay. Let's say you, you did not read the answer on the upper part. Let's identify, let's follow the key, let's follow the procedure. How to read the ECG. First is identify the waves, okay? Are waves complete? Let's check. P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S, T. There is one P wave every Q, R, S. There is one T wave after Q, R, S. Waves are complete. Very good. Next, check the heart rate. Let's use the six magic numbers. Look for an R wave that falls directly on a dark line. This is R wave number one, R wave number two, R wave number three, number four, number five, number six. What R wave you think falls directly on a dark line? We can use R wave number one, right? So R wave number one falls directly on a dark line. The next dark line, let's start counting. 300, 150, 100. So what, is, what do you think is the heart rate of your patient? The heart rate of your patient is between 100 to 150 beats per minute. It's more than 100 because this is 100. It goes beyond. So it's between 100 to 150. So we know that this is tachycardia, more than 100. We know it's tachycardia. Next, check for the PR interval. Again, PR interval is three to five small boxes. So this is our PR interval. How many small boxes do we have for your PR interval? One, two, three. Three small boxes. One, two, three. Three small boxes. Question, is the PR interval here normal? Yes, it is. Normal PR interval. Heart rate is more than 100. Waves are complete. 
Now check for rhythm. Do you think we have rhythm and the specific tracing? Now, even without using a caliper, even without using a bond paper to check their interval, their spacing, we can clearly see by merely looking at it that there is rhythm. Am I right? Okay, there is rhythm. There is rhythm. So if there is rhythm, sign is rhythm, but the heart rate is more than 100. So this is what we call your sinus tachycardia. So how would you know if it is sinus tachycardia? Waves are complete. Waves are complete. Heart rate is more than 100. PR interval is normal and with rhythm. Now, if a patient has sinus tachycardia, what are common medications do we give? A patient with sinus tachycardia, we can give calcium blockers. We can give beta blockers. Am I right? And apart from that, because of sinus tachycardia, make it sure that you have to avoid chocolates, you have to avoid caffeine, avoid coffee, because the more it increases the heart rate of your patient. What else? Because of sinus tachycardia, we can do carotid massage. The carotid massage will stimulate the vagus nerve, and the vagal nerve stimulation can cause bradycardia. It will bring down the heart rate of your patient. Okay? So again, sinus tachycardia, we give beta blockers, we can give calcium blockers, avoid caffeine, avoid chocolates, we do carotid massage. Okay? Sinus tachycardia. Let's proceed. This is what we call your sinus bradycardia. How will you know if it is sinus bradycardia? Again, we follow the flow, the procedure, how to take, what to do if you have ECG strip in front of you. Check the completeness of waves. We follow the key, the protocol. So let's identify, are waves complete? P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S. So we have one P wave, one P wave before Q, R, S. One T wave every after Q, R, S. Are waves complete? Yes, they are complete. Complete waves. Next, identify the heart rate. So again, let's use the six magic numbers. Our wave that falls directly on a dark line. Start counting. 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50. See that? This R wave almost falls on the 50 line. Therefore, this heart rate is 50 beats per minute. So is it normal? No, because the normal is 60 to 100. Less than 60 is bradycardia. So now you know the patient here, the patient here is bradycardic. Next, identify PR interval. The normal PR interval is three to five small boxes. So this is our PR interval. One, two, three, four, five. PR interval. One, two, three, four, five. Normal PR interval five small boxes. So again, waves are complete. Heart rate is less than 60. PR interval is normal. Look for the rhythm. Even without using caliper, without using my bond paper, you will know that they have equal spacing, equal rhythm, okay, equal interval. So with rhythm. So this is what we call your sinus bradycardia or sinus bradycardia. By the way, bradycardia or sinus bradycardia is expected or normal to elderly and athletic people, okay? And if you have sinus bradycardia, common management here is we give atropine. Your atropine will increase the heart rate of your patient, okay? Let's proceed. This is what we call your atrial flutter, okay? Now, first thing to do, the moment you will encounter this one, a strip, again, check for the completeness of your waves. So let's start. Can we identify P wave? It's hard to identify the P wave, but we know that features like this, it looks like sawtooth. Am I right? It looks like sawtooth. We can identify P wave. What about the QRS? Can we see QRS? Yes, there is QRS. In short, if there is QRS complex, there is no problem with the ventricle. Am I right? Remember, QRS complex will represent the activity of the ventricle. So there's ventricular activity. The issue there is your P wave. So if it's a P wave issue, that's atrial in origin. Remember, P wave represents the activity of the atria. So let's check. No P wave appears soft. Next, what about rhythm? Do we have rhythm here? Do you have rhythm? Yes, same interval, same interval. Now, if this is a six-second strip, all you have to do is to count how many R waves inside the six-second strip. 
Am I right? And multiply that, that by 10, you will have your specific heart rate. Now, what makes this atrial flutter? This is atrial flutter because P wave resembles sawtooth appearance with rhythm, with rhythm, with QRS complex. Okay? So again, atrial flutter with rhythm, P wave resembles sawtooth in appearance, okay? And there is QRS complex. A patient with atrial flutter, what we usually do, we give PQA drugs. So what are these PQA drugs? PQA drugs, these drugs agent stands for, P stands for procainamide, Q stands for kinidine. Procainamide and kinidine are antidysrhythmic agents. And last A, A stands for your aspirin. Aspirin is a form of an antiplatelet drug. We always give antiplatelet aspirin to patients with atrial dysrhythmia, maybe atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, as long as it's atrial dysrhythmia, because a patient with atrial dysrhythmia, there's a higher risk for stroke, specifically your CBA named as thromboembolic stroke, because there are different types of strokes, right? But that will be discussed in a different video clip, okay? Just don't forget, a patient with atrial dysrhythmia, we give aspirin, okay, to prevent clot or prevent platelet to form a clot, okay? Because there, there's a higher chance of what we call thrombus, okay, going inside the brain causing stroke. Okay, so apart from your PQA beds, patient with atrial flutter, we also do cardioversion. So in cardioversion, we give electric shock to your patient, synchronize its QRS complex, specifically in your R wave. So when we do electric shock for your cardioversion, we deliver the shock specifically during R wave or QRS complex. But it's why we cannot do cardioversion without QRS complex, without R wave. Okay, so what's good with your cardioversion is that, okay, in your cardioversion, we start with the smallest uh, energy delivery or smallest joule. Usually, we'll start at 50 joules, then progress that from 50 to 100, then 150, then 200 joules. So 50 joules, 100 joules, 150 joules, then we give 200 joules as max. Okay, that's your cardioversion. Okay? So this is what we call your atrial flutter. Next is what we call your atrial fibrillation. Now, look at your atrial fibrillation. Compare that with your atrial flutter. They both have Q wave. Am I right? They both have Q wave in your atrial flutter. What makes it different is that atrial flutter has rhythm. Rhythm. Atrial fibrillation has no rhythm. Look, they don't have the same spacing, no rhythm at all. Therefore, to identify if it is atrial fibrillation, just remember, in atrial fibrillation, there is QRS complex, no P wave, and take note, no rhythm. But if that thing has QRS with rhythm, P wave resembles sawtooth, that becomes atrial flutter. But if it has no rhythm, okay, that becomes your atrial fibrillation. Same with your atrial flutter. In atrial fibrillation, we give PQA, procainamide, kinidin, aspirin, and we also do cardioversion. Okay? Next is your ventricular tachycardia, one of the deadliest dysrhythmia, your VTAC. Okay? So if it's ventricular, so the issue here is your QRS, right? So how will you identify if it's ventricular tachycardia? In ventricular tachycardia, the tracing is wide and bizarre. Here, wide and bizarre. But take note, there is rhythm. Look, they have the same, the same, the same interval. Okay? So a patient with VTAC, ventricular tachycardia, VTAC, the tracing is wide and bizarre, but there is rhythm. Okay? And how do we treat patient with VTAC? For patient with VTAC, we give LM drugs. What's your LM drugs? We give lidocaine and we give magnesium sulfate. The reason in giving magnesium sulfate to patient is to prevent a polymorphic ventricular dysrhythmia. We call the type of, okay, of polymorphic ventricular dysrhythmia as what we call torsade de poids. Some would say torsades de pointes, but 
a lot of uh, scholars, I hear them saying torsa de poix, okay? So I'd rather say torsa de poix. So again, the reason in giving magnesium sulfate is to prevent polymorphic ventricular dysrhythmia called torsa de poix, okay? Now, can we do cardioversion defibrillation for VTAC? That depends. If a patient with VTAC has no pulse, pulseless ventricular tachycardia, no pulse, we do defibrillation. But if VTAC has pulse, with pulse, more stable VTAC, we do cardioversion, okay? So what is the difference between cardioversion and defibrillation? In cardioversion, we deliver shock specific, synchronized to the QRS complex, specifically in the R wave. And in cardioversion, we start and we use a smaller energy, 50, then 100, then 150 to 200. But in defibrillation, it's different. We deliver shock at any phase of the cardiac cycle. That's your defibrillation. And in defibrillation, we use a higher energy. We start at 200 joules. Then from 200, we can accelerate that from 200 to 300 joules, then 360, then 360, okay? So max is your 360 joules. That is why if in your defibrillation, we use a higher energy, there's a higher risk of burn injuries to skin or skin breakdown if you do defibrillation, especially if you use paddle when you defibrillate the patient, okay? Anyway, that's your ventricular tachycardia. Next, if there's such thing as your VTAC, we also have your VFib. Now look, ventricular fibrillation, look at your fibrillation, and look at your VTAC. What's the difference? VTAC, look, with rhythm. Fibrillation, no rhythm. Does it ring a bell? Remember a while ago when I talked about atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation? Atrial flutter with rhythm. Atrial fibrillation, no rhythm. Therefore, remember, anything that has fibrillation in it, no rhythm. So no rhythm, the tracing is chaotic and disorganized, okay? So again, if the tracing has rhythm, wide, bizarre, that's your VTAC. If a tracing is chaotic, disorganized, no rhythm, that's your ventricular fibrillation. So a patient with VFib, how do we treat patient with this type of problem? We follow a specific protocol, and we call that protocol flow as your DILM. D-E-A-L-M, your DILM. D stands for defibrillation. E stands for epinephrine. A stands for amiodarone. Amiodarone is your class three antidysrhythmic drug, okay? Amiodarone. Uh, L stands for lidocaine. And M stands for magnesium sulfate. So that's your deal. D-E-A-L-M. That will be the protocol we follow treating patient with ventricular fibrillation. Okay? Next, PVC. That's your premature ventricular complex or other book. They call it your premature ventricular contraction. Ibig sabihin, or in short, when you say PVC, the ventricles prematurely contract. Okay? Look. P wave, after P wave, QRS. After QRS is your T wave. After T wave, what must be the next wave? It must be P wave that represents atrial stimulation, atrial activity. Unfortunately, without atrial activity, there is already ventricular activity. In short, the ventricles contracted prematurely. This is your PVC or premature ventricular complex or premature ventricular contraction. Things to remember if you're working in the hospital. If you have six PVCs or more in one minute, okay, six or more PVCs in one minute, you need to notify the physician because that could be an indication of a pending cardiac arrest. Or if you have two or more PVCs in a row, notify the physician. That could be an indication of a pending cardiac arrest. But again, it doesn't follow always. Because if your patient has an existing cardiac problem, sometimes they have PVCs. It's normal for them to have PVCs. But generally speaking, six or more PVCs in one minute, two or more PVCs in a row, notify the physician, okay? So again, that's your PVC. Same, we give your lidocaine, we may give magnesium sulfate, okay? 
This is what we call their asystole or flat line. Among the tracing rhythm, this is the most and the easiest to identify. Flat line. Correct? Question. If a patient is in asystole or asystole, do we defibrillate patient with this type of tracing? Answer, no. So when do we defibrillate patient? If you have asystole or asystole, you need to convert this to ventricular dysrhythmia before you can defibrillate the patient. Again, do not defibrillate patient in asystole. You need to convert this to ventricular dysrhythmia before you can defibrillate. Okay? So what will be our protocol for asystole or flat line? You follow the American Heart Association chain of survival. Okay? I know you're familiar with that when you had your ACLS and BLS training, okay? Next is your AV block. So there are three common types of AV blocks. The first degree AV block, the second degree AV blocks, okay? And the third degree AV block. Your second degree AV block has two categories. It can be Mobitz 1 or Mobitz 2. Okay, now look. Look at your first degree AV block. First thing to remember, look at the waves. Are waves complete? P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S, T. Waves are complete. By merely looking at the tracing, you know that there is rhythm, right? Almost rhythm with regular. But look at your PR interval. The normal PR interval is three to five small boxes. How many boxes do we have? This is your PR interval. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There are 9 box, small boxes for your PR interval. Another thing, PR interval, is it prolonged? Yes. Is it prolonged? Yes. Therefore, if you have a complete waves, almost regular rhythm, but the PR interval is consistently prolonged, that is your first degree AV block. So again, how will you know if it's first degree AV block? Waves are complete. Rhythm is almost regular. It's just that the PR interval is consistently prolonged. In short, more than five small boxes. That is your first degree AV block. For your second degree AV block, Mobitz 1, because remember I said your second degree is categorized into two. It could be Mobitz 1 or Mobitz 2. In your second degree AV block, Mobitz 1, Look at your PR interval. The PR interval gets progressively longer. Okay? Waves are complete. P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S, T. Waves are complete. Rhythm, almost regular. But look at your PR interval. The PR interval gets progressively longer. What makes it different from your first degree AV block? In your first degree AV block, all PR intervals are consistently prolonged. But the moment that your PR interval gets progressively longer, that becomes your second degree AV block, Mobitz 1. Okay? So in first degree, PR consistently prolonged. In second degree, Mobitz 1, PR gets progressively longer. Waves are complete. One P wave in every QRS, one T wave after QRS. Look at your second degree AV block, Mobitz 2. In Mobitz 2, there could be two P waves, okay, before QRS. Look, P, Q, R, S, T. Another P, another P, Q, R, S, T. In short, it is your second degree AV block, Mobitz 2. If, if there are more than one P wave, in every QRS. But if you check the PR interval using the P wave near to the QRS, again, more than one P wave before QRS. But if you use the P wave near to the QRS for the PR interval, the PR interval is normal. Okay? If you use P wave near to the QRS, not the P wave far from the QRS, the nearest P wave to the QRS, then you have a normal PR interval. Again, normal PR interval is three to five small boxes. Let's count. One, two, three, four, five. Five small boxes. One, two, 
three, four, five. Five small boxes. So again, second degree AV block mobits two. More than one P wave in every QRS. But if you use the P wave near to the QRS, the PR interval is normal. The moment that the PR interval is not normal, that is your third degree AV block. So in third degree AV block, there could be more than one P wave in every QRS. The PR interval is inconsistent. It could be normal or it could be prolonged. Look, R, S, am I right? K, P, 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 P. More than one P wave in every QRS complex. But if you use the P wave near, near to your QRS, it could be normal, it could be prolonged. Therefore, the relationship of your PR interval in your third degree AB block is consistent. It could be normal, it could be prolonged. That is why among the AB blocks, your third degree AV block is the most serious because this is your complete heart block. Can you follow? This is the most serious among the AV blocks. Okay? So just a recap. First degree AV block. First degree AV block, all PR interval consistently prolonged. Second degree AV block, the PR interval gets progressively longer. Okay? This is your Mobitz 1. Second degree AV block, Mobitz 2, more than one P wave in every QRS. But if you use the P wave near to the QRS, it will give you a normal PR interval. But for third degree AV block, maybe more than one P wave in every QRS, and the PR interval is inconsistent. It can be normal, it can be prolonged. So among the three types of AV blocks, it is your third degree AV block said to be the most serious, complete AV block. So what do we do here? We may do pacemaker implantation. We may also give atropine to your patient, okay? That's your complete AV block, okay? I hope you learn, okay, common ACD tracings as well as management, okay? Next, let's talk about hypertrophy or enlargement. Hypertrophy refers to increase in the size because there's an increase in the size of the cell. So when the, cells, when the cell increases its size, it follows that the organ also increases its size. There's what we call enlargement, called hypertrophy. What makes it different from hyperplasia is that in hyperplasia, there could be increase in the size of an organ brought about by increase in the number of cells. In hypertrophy, only increase in the size of cell without increasing the number of cells. In hyperplasia, the size of the cell remains it's just that the number of cells increase, okay? So hypertrophy is increased in the size. So in hypertrophy means enlargement. The enlargement there can be in the atrial area, chamber, or ventricular chamber. So there is such thing as what we call atrial hypertrophy and ventricular hypertrophy. There is such thing to be specific called right atrial hypertrophy, left atrial hypertrophy, right ventricular hypertrophy, left ventricular hypertrophy. But among the chambers here, these two chambers, the cave, the atria, and the ventricle, it's your ventricle subject more for enlargement because of the workload, okay? Now, when is the right ventricle chamber, okay, when do we have hypertrophy in the right chamber, right ventricle chamber? Remember that the right ventricle pumps blood going to your lungs. If you have an existing pulmonary problem, for example, you have COPD, specifically you have bronchitis, or another condition if you have pulmonary hypertension. If you, increase, if you have increased pressure, if you have increased pressure in the pulmonary area, what happens there is that that will increase the afterload of the right ventricle. When you say afterload, that is the pressure that the heart needs to overcome to push the blood out. Because of an existing pulmonary problem, the right ventricle needs to increase its effort workload to push the, feed the blood out. As a result, increased workload in the right ventricle, the right ventricle will compensate, increasing its what? Size, causing right ventricular enlargement or right ventricular hypertrophy. Now, what do you call that condition when the right ventricle increases its size because of pulmonary problem? 
you call that disorder, you call that condition as carpulmonal or your carpulmonale. So to treat carpulmonal or carpulmonale is to treat pulmonary problem, okay? What about left ventricular hypertrophy or your LVH? Left ventricle, we know that the left ventricle pumps the blood to your systemic circulation. If you have persistent elevation in the blood pressure because you are the patient who is non-compliant to your antihypertensive drug, sorry, because of that, because of persistent elevation in the blood pressure, vascular resistance increases. That is why if the pressure outside is so high, the left ventricle needs to increase its workload just to push the blood out. As a result, the left ventricle increases its size, causing left ventricular hypertrophy or left ventricular enlargement. That is why you have to take your antihypertensive drug religiously. This will decrease the risk of enlargement of the heart. Okay? So how will we know that there is atrial enlargement? How will we know that there is ventricular enlargement? Just a recap. P wave represents atrial activity. QRS represents ventricular activity. That is why if you suspect atrial problem, check the P wave. If you suspect ventricular problem, check the QRS complex. We know that, right? But remember, there are 12 leads. There are 12 leads. We have lead 1, lead 2, lead 3, AVR, AVL, AVF, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. What specific lead I need to check if I want to know if there's hypertrophy? Am I right? Well, simple. Check lead V1, vector 1. Don't forget that. If you check hypertrophy, always check vector 1 or lead V1 or precordial V1. Okay? Now look. This is your P wave, QRST. Remember what I told you? One small box is one millimeter. In V1, normally in V1, you can barely see the P wave. Okay? You can barely see the P wave in lead V1. But if in your V1, the height of your P wave is equal to or greater than two millimeters. In short, how many boxes will that be? Two or more boxes. Height, remember? ISO electric line. One, two, three. How many millimeters is your P wave in V1? Given this is three millimeters, that is atrial enlargement or atrial hypertrophy. Because normally in V1, the P wave, okay, you can barely see the P wave in V1. If you can see P wave in V1, the height of the P wave must be less than 2 millimeters. If the height of P wave in V1 is equal or greater than 2 millimeters, there's atrial enlargement. Okay? Next, this is your atrial hypertrophy. Again, B1. This is your right ventricular hypertrophy. Right? Ventricular hypertrophy. Again, check B1. Look, this is your lead 1, lead 2, lead 3. AVR, AVL, AVF. V1, V2, V3. V4, V5, V6. Okay, this is your V1. Long V1. Now, I said ventricles, ventricular activity is represented, okay, in your ECG as your QRS complex. So look at your QRS complex. Look at your QRS. Ideally, in your V1, the R wave is short. The S wave is tall. If the R wave in V1 is taller than your S wave, okay, that is right ventricular hypertrophy. Sir, I don't get it. Okay, look, let me check. Okay, hold on. Okay, here. Look, this is your V1, right? This is your V1. Look at your QRS complex, okay? P, Q, R, S. This is your R, this is your S. Your R wave is short, correct? 
This is your isoelectric line. R wave is short. S wave is tall compared to your R wave. This is normal. In V1, R wave must be short. S wave must be tall. If in your V1, R wave is taller than S wave, that is right ventricular hypertrophy. Look. Look, in V1, R wave is taller than S wave. This is right ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, I hope you learned something. So this could be an indicative of your car pulmonale or your car pulmonale where there's enlargement of the right ventricle due to pulmonary problem. Okay, now what about for left ventricle enlargement or LVH or left ventricle hypertrophy? For your left ventricle hypertrophy, you need to include B5. Okay. So you have to sum, you have to add S wave in V1 and R wave in V5. Again, you have to add the height of S wave in V1 and R wave in V5. Remember, one big box, five millimeters, okay? So what is the result? If your S wave in V1 and R wave in V5, is equal to or greater than 35 millimeters there is left ventricular hypertrophy or left ventricular enlargement okay let's check so let's identify v1 here and this is your v5 so how many millimeters will this be this is 5 10 15 15 millimeters plus 2 this will be 17 so the rk the s wave in v1 is 17 okay what about, the, what about the R wave in V5? Let's use this one, V5. So this is 5, 10, 15, 20 plus 4, 24 millimeters. 24 plus 17, how much would that be? That would be 36. Did you get it right? 24, I don't know. I hate math, okay? Given it's more than 35 millimeters, it's... 17 right okay it's more than 35 millimeters I, I, I lost track about the numbers okay it's more than 35 millimeters so this is your left ventricular hypertrophy or left ventricular enlargement okay so again you just have to add the s wave in v1 and r wave in v5 if the sum is equal or greater than 35 millimeters mercury 35 millimeters not millimeters mercury greater than or equal to 35 millimeters then that is left ventricular hypertrophy or left ventricular enlargement, okay? So let's run down, okay, our concept. Normal sinus rhythm, how will you know it's normal sinus rhythm? Waves are complete, am I right? Okay, with rhythm, okay, one P wave every QRS, one T wave after QRS, okay, and the heart rate is 60 to 100. Okay, normal PR interval. Sinus tachycardia, waves are complete, am I right? Waves are complete, PR interval is normal, it's just that the heart rate is more than 100. So we give beta blockers here, calcium blockers, we, give carotid, we do carotid massage. And I said, avoid caffeine, avoid chocolates. Sinus bradycardia means to say that waves are complete, it's just that the heart rate is less than 60. PR interval is normal. I said that sinus bradycardia is expected normal for elderly and athletic people. And the drug of choice here is your atropine. Okay. For your atrial fibrillation, remember it's fibrillation. Again, no rhythm. So in atrial fibrillation, no P wave. Am I right? There is QRS. No rhythm. Okay. No rhythm. So what do we do here? We give PQA drugs. What's your PQA drugs? Procainamide, kinidine. These two are your... These two are your sodium channel blockers. These are actually the class one of an antidysrhythmic drug. And apart from your PQ, we give aspirin. It's just a form of an anti-platelet. And we also do cardioversion. Okay? Atrial flutter. I said in atrial flutter, okay, the P wave resembles sawtooth in appearance. There is rhythm. There is QRS complex. 
So say we do PQA drugs, we do cardioversion. VTAC, I said VTAC, tracing is why bizarre. VTAC uh, with rhythm, and in VTAC, there is, yeah, with rhythm. In VTAC, if it with pulse, we do cardioversion. If without pulse, we do defibrillation. We also give ML drugs, the shirt, magnesium sulfate, and then your lidocaine. I said that, okay? For ventricular, for, again, it's fibrillation. There's no rhythm, right? In ventricular fibrillation, I said there's no rhythm. The tracing is chaotic and disorganized, okay? So if it's your ventricular fibrillation, no identifiable way, identifiable ways, chaotic and disorganized. And I said, we follow a protocol called DIOM, okay? What's your DIOM? The fibrillation, epinephrine, amiodarone, lidocaine, and magnesium sulfate. I'm done saying all those top. Your PVC, your premature ventricular complex. I said there's no P wave, automatic QRS complex, sometimes with a compensatory pause. And I said in your PVCs, if you have six or more PVCs in one minute, or two or more PVCs in a row, notify the physician. Okay? That give an indication of a pending cardiac arrest. I said that. Okay, just a recap for patient with atrial dysrhythmia, atrial problem, we give PQA, procainamide, quinidine, aspirin. For patient with ventricular dysrhythmia, we give ML, magnesium sulfate, and lidocaine. Okay, for first degree AV block, I said waves are complete, rhythm is usually regular, it's just that the PR interval is what? Consistently prolonged. Okay, consistently prolonged. That's greater than? or more than five small boxes. For your second degree AV block mobits one, I said the PR interval gets progressively longer, okay? That's your second degree AV block mobits one. So just remember, if the PR interval is consistently prolonged, that's first degree. If the PR interval gets progressively longer, that's your second degree AV block mobits one. But if you have more than one P wave in every QRS, but the PR interval is normal if you, use, if you use the P wave near to the QRS, that is your second degree AV block moments too. More than one P wave in every QRS, usually rhythm is regular. P wave near to the QRS complex, if you use the P wave near to the QRS, you will get a normal PR interval. But if the PR interval is inconsistent, sometimes normal, sometimes prolonged, that is your third degree AV block or a complete heart block, which is more fatal among the AV blocks, okay? So here, indicated here will be your pacemaker implantation, okay? So now, as is told, I said that, flat lines, no waves. Again, we cannot defibrillate. So we need to convert this acetole or acetolate to ventricular dysrhythmia before we can defibrillate the patient, okay? So let's try to, let's try to, answer some drills here. I will no longer discuss that. That is for your ALS. So let's identify common tracings here. Now look at the tracing. P wave, you can identify the P wave, but there is QRS. But take note, they don't have rhythm. No rhythm, fibrillation but with QRS QRS ventricle so the problem is P wave so this is your atrial fibrillation okay atrial fibrillation what about next slide make a wild guess what do you think is this you are correct if you answered atrial flutter remember resembles sawtooth in appearance okay and rhythm is usually regular and there's QRS complex Correct, it's your atrial flutter. What about this one? Take note. Make a wild guess. What do you think is a tracing here? If you answered AV block, you are correct. But what specific AV block? Look, the PR interval is normal. PR interval prolonged. Am I right? So it's inconsistent. So what is this? Third degree AV block or your complete heart block. What about this one? 
More than one P wave in every QRS, but the PR interval is normal. So again, it's AV block, but this is short. Second degree AV block, Mobitz 2. Second degree AV block, Mobitz 2. What about this? Waves are complete. Again, look at your PR interval. The PR interval is so prolonged, right? Consistently prolonged. And what is that? AV block, correct. What type of AV block? First degree AV block. Waves are complete, regular. Rhythm is usually regular. It's just that the PR interval is consistently prolonged. Okay? So this is your first degree AV block. It's so hard because it's moving. I know. It shouldn't be okay, it should be on the easy strip for us to clearly evaluate and count the number of boxes. You understand? What about this one? This is what we call second degree AV block Mobitz 1. Why? PR interval, PR interval gets progressively longer. Remember? If the PR interval gets progressively longer, that is your second degree AV block Mobitz 1. Okay. Okay, let's identify the tracings here. Oh, what is this? That's your PVC. Another PVC. Another PVC. Another PVC. Another PVC. What did it tell you? If you have six or more PVCs in one minute or two or more in a row, notify the physician, right? So let's say you have more PVCs there. You didn't do anything. You just want to check the patient what will happen after PVCs. So you have what? VTAP. So from PVC, it progresses to ventricular tachycardia. Let's see what will happen next. So from VTAC, it looks like torsade de poids. Okay? So from PVC to VTAC to torsade de poids. And then prior to that, it looks like atrial fibrillation. And then eventually, patient head now asystole or asystole. Okay? So we had the PVC, we have the VTAC, you have your torsade de poids, your atrial fibrillation, then you have your asystole or asystole. I hope we were able to identify the tracings. I hope you learned something, guys. So if you have any questions or concerns or any clarifications, send a direct message to me or you can comment on the key comment section below okay have a great day and god bless everyone keep safe bye